this whispered audio reading of A Christmas Carol. So when we left Scrooge, he and the ghost of Christmas present had just spent some time spying on the Cratchits as they enjoyed their Christmas dinner, where Scrooge had been shocked to hear of Tiny Tim's likely fate. We join them once more as they leave the Cratchits and take to the streets, air and sea to observe what some other people are experiencing on their Christmas days. And now, without a word of warning from the ghost, they stood upon a bleak and desert moor, where monstrous masses of rude stone were cast about, as though it were the burial place of giants, and water spread itself wheresoever it listed, or would have done so, but for the frost that held it prisoner. And nothing grew but moss and furs, and coarse, rank grass. Down in the west, the setting sun had left a streak of fiery red, which glared upon the desolation for an instant, like a sullen eye, and frowning lower, 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 yet was lost in the thick gloom of darkest night. What place is this? asked Scrooge. A place where miners live, who labour in the bowels of the earth, returned the spirit. But they know me, see? A light shone from the window of a hut, and swiftly they advanced towards it, passing through the wall of mud and stone, they found a cheerful company assembled round a glowing fire, an old, old man and woman with their children and their children's children, and another generation beyond that out gaily in their holiday attire. The old man, in a voice that seldom rose above the howling of the wind upon the barren waste, was singing them a Christmas song. It had been a very old song when he was a boy, and from time to time they all joined in the chorus. So surely they raised their voices. The old man got quite blithe and loud, and so surely as they stopped, his figure sank again. The spirit did not tarry here, but bade Scrooge hold his robe, and passing on above the moor, sped. Whither? Not to see. To see. To Scrooge's horror, looking back, he saw the last of the land, a frightful range of rocks behind them, and his ears were deafened by the thundering of water as it rolled and roared and raged among the dreadful caverns it had worn, and fiercely tried to undermine the earth, built upon a dismal reef of sunken rocks some league or so from shore, on which the waters chaffed and dashed the wild year through, there stood a solitary lighthouse. Great heaps of seaweed clung to its base, and storm birds, born of the wind, one might suppose, a seaweed of the water, rose and fell about it like the waves they skimmed. But even here, two men who watched the light had made a fire that, through the loophole in the thick stone wall, 
shed out a ray of brightness on the awful sea. Joining their horny hands over the rough table at which they sat, they wished each other Merry Christmas in their can of grog, and one of them, the elder, too, with his face all damaged and scarred with hard weather, as the figurehead of an old ship might be, struck up a sturdy song that was like a gale itself. Again the ghost sped on, above the black and heaving sea, on, on until, being far away, as he told Scrooge, from any shore, they lighted on a ship. They stood beside the helmsman at the wheel, the lookout in the bow, the officers who had the watch, dark, ghostly figures in their several stations, but every man among them hummed a Christmas tune, or had a Christmas thought, or spoke below his breath to his companion of some bygone Christmas day with homeward hopes belonging to it, and every man on board waking or sleeping, good or bad, had had a kinder word for another on that day than on any day in the year, and had shared to some extent its festivities, and had remembered those he cared for at a distance, and had known that they delighted to remember him. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, while listening to the moaning of the wind, and thinking what a solemn thing it was to move on through the lonely darkness over an unknown abyss whose depths were secrets as profound as death. It was a great surprise to Scrooge while thus engaged to hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognise it as his own nephew's and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room, with the spirit standing, smiling by his side, and looking at that same nephew with approving affability. <laughs> Laughed the Scrooge's nephew. <laughs>
with a dimple, surprised looking capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed made to be kissed, as no doubt it was, all kinds of good little dots about her chin that melted into one another when she laughed, and the sunniest pair of eyes you ever saw in any little creature's head. Although she was what you would have called provoking, you know, but satisfactory too. Oh, perfectly satisfactory. So, um, this is kind of unusual in an audiobook reading, but I can't help but interject here um, to make the observation that Charles Dickens is clearly a bit of an old pervert, isn't he? And I've never noticed it when I've read this before, but perhaps I've never read these passages properly when I was younger, or the movie versions I've seen. I've never included this, but there's a couple of passages throughout the book where it's clear to me that he's obsessed with young women, isn't he? Anyway, that aside, I'm going to read on and please try to remember that this book was written in the 1830s, I think, just after Queen Victoria came to the throne. So, times were different. Times were very, very different. And um, most of this book is fine. It's hard reading some of the way he writes and some of his sentences are too long they're a, and a bit flowery um, and kind of the sentence structure seems almost back to front but 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 it's a fantastic story and I'm just going to have to overlook um, some of these minor indiscretions of Charles Dickens anyway I shall carry on he's a comical old fellow said Scrooge's nephew that's the truth and not so pleasant as he might be however his offences carry their own punishment and I have nothing to say against him I'm sure he is very rich Fred hinted Scrooge's niece at least you always tell me so what of that, my dear, said Scrooge's nephew. His wealth is of no use to him. He don't do any good with it. He don't make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking <laughs> that he is ever going to benefit us with it. I have no patience with him, observed Scrooge's niece. Scrooge's niece's sisters and all the other ladies expressed the same opinion. Oh, I have, said Scrooge's nephew. I am sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself, always. Here, he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? He don't lose much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's niece. Everybody else said the same, and they must be allowed to have been competent judges, because they had just had dinner, and, with the dessert upon the table, were clustered round the fire by lamplight. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, said Scrooge's nephew, because I haven't great faith in these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Topper had clearly got his eye upon one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, for he answered that a bachelor was a wretched outcast, who has no right to express an opinion on the subject. Whereat, Scrooge 
George's niece's sister, the plump one with the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, blushed. Do go on, Fred, said Scrooge's niece, clapping her hands. He never finishes what he begins to say. He is such a ridiculous fellow. Scrooge's nephew reveled in another high laugh, and, as it was impossible to keep the infection off, though the plump sister tried hard to do it with aromatic vinegar, his example was unanimously followed. I was only going to say, said Scrooge's nephew, that the consequence of his taking a dislike to us and not making merry with us is, as I think, that he loses some pleasant moments which could do him no harm. I am sure he loses pleasanter companions than he can find in his own thoughts, either in his mouldy old office or his dusty chambers. I mean, give him the same chance every year whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. He may rail at Christmas till he dies, but he can't help thinking better of it. I defy him if he finds me going there in good temper year after year and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? If it only puts him in the vein to leave his poor clerk fifty pounds, that's something and I think I shook him yesterday. It was their turn to laugh now at the notion of shaking Scrooge. But being thoroughly good-natured, and not much caring what they laughed at, so that they laughed at any rate, he encouraged them in their merriment, and passed the bottle joyously. After tea they had some music, for they were a musical family, and knew what they were about when they sung a glee or a catch. I can assure you, especially Topper, who could growl away in the bass like a good one, and never swell the large veins in his forehead, or get red in the face over it. Scrooge's niece played well upon the harp, and played among other tunes a simple little air, Amid nothing, you might learn to whistle it in two minutes, which had been familiar to the child who fetched Scrooge from the boarding school, as he had been reminded by the ghost of Christmas past. When this strain of music sounded, all the things that the ghost had shown him came upon his mind. He softened more and more, and thought that if he could have listened to it, often, years ago, he might have cultivated the kindness of life for his own happiness with his own hands, without resorting to the sextant's spade that buried Jacob Marley. But they didn't devote the whole evening to music. After a while, they played at forfeits, for it is good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas, when its mighty founder was a child himself. Stop! There was first a game at Blyman's Buff. Of course there was, and I no more believe Topper was really blind than I believe he had eyes in his boots. My opinion is that it was a done thing between him and Scrooge's nephew, and that the ghost of Christmas present knew it. The way he went after that plump sister in the lace tucker was an outrage on the credulity of the human race, knocking down the fire irons, tumbling over the chairs, bumping against the piano, smothering himself among the curtains. Wherever she went, there went he. He always knew where the plump sister was. He wouldn't catch anybody else. If you had fallen up against him, as some of them did, on purpose, he would have made a feint of endeavouring to seize you, which would have been an affront to your understanding and would instantly have sidled off in the direction of the plump sister. She often cried out that it wasn't fair, and it really was not. But 
then his conduct was the most execrable. For his pretending not to know her, his pretending that it was necessary to touch her headdress, and further to assure himself of her identity by pressing a certain ring upon her finger, and a certain chain about her neck, was vile, monstrous. No doubt she told him her opinion of it, when, another blind man being in office, they were so very confidential together, behind the curtains. Scrooge's niece was not one of the blind man's puff party, but was made comfortable with a large chair and footstool in a snug corner, where the ghost and Scrooge were close behind her. But she joined in the forfeits, and loved her love to admiration with all the letters of the alphabet. Likewise, at the game of how, when, and where, she was very great, and, to the secret joy of Scrooge's nephew, beat her sister's hollow, though they were sharp girls too, as Topper could have told you. There might have been twenty people there, young and old, but they all played, and so did Scrooge, for wholly forgetting in the interest he had in what was going on, that his voice made no sound in their ears. He sometimes came out with his guess quite loud, and very often guessed it quite right, too, for the sharpest needle best white chapel, warranted not to cut in the eye, was not sharper than Scrooge, blunt as he took it in his head to be. The ghost was greatly pleased to see him in this mood, and looked upon him with such favour, that he begged like a boy to be allowed to stay until the guests departed. But this the spirit said could not be done. It is a new game, said Scrooge. One half hour, spirit, only one. It was a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something, and the rest must find out what. He only answering to their questions, yes or no as the case was. The brisk fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live, rather a disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes, and talked sometimes, and lived in London and walked about the streets, and wasn't made a show of, and wasn't led by anybody, and didn't live in a menagerie, and was never killed in a market, and was not a horse, or an ass, or a cow, or a bull, or a tiger, or a dog, or a pig, or a cat. question that was put to him, this nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter, and was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get up off the sofa and stamp. At last the plump sister, falling into a similar state, cried out, Is it a bear? Ought to have been, yes. 
yes, inasmuch as an answer in the negative was sufficient to have diverted their thoughts from Mr. Scrooge, supposing they had ever had any tendency that way. He has given us plenty of merriment, I am sure, said Fred, and it would be ungrateful not to drink his health. Here is a glass of mulled wine ready to our hand at the moment, and I say, Uncle Scrooge. Well, Uncle Scrooge, they cried, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, whatever he is, said Scrooge's nephew. He wouldn't take it from me, but may he have it, nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge. Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become so gay and light of heart that he would have pledged the unconscious company in return and thanked them in an inaudible speech if the ghost had given him time. But the whole scene passed off in the breath of the last words spoken by his nephew and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw, and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirit stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful, on foreign lands, and they were close at home, by struggling men, and they were patient in their greater hope, by poverty, and it was rich, in almshouse, hospital, and jail, in miseries every refuge, where vain man in his little brief authority had not made fast the door, and barred the spirit out, he left his blessing, and taught Scrooge his precepts. It was a long night, if it were only a night, but Scrooge had his doubts of this, because the Christmas holidays appeared to be condensed into the space of time they passed together. It was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. Scrooge had observed this change, but never spoke of it until they left a children's twelfth night party, when, looking at the spirit as they stood together in an open place, he noticed that his hair was grey. Are spirits' lives so short? asked Scrooge. My life upon this globe is very brief, replied the ghost. It ends tonight. Tonight, cried Scrooge. Tonight, at midnight. Hark, the time is drawing near. The chimes were ringing the three quarters past eleven at that moment. Forgive me if I am not justified in what I ask, said Scrooge, looking intently at the spirit's robe. But I see something strange, and not belonging to yourself, protruding from your skirts. Is it a foot, or a claw? It might be a claw, for the flesh there is upon it, was the spirit's sorrowful reply. Look here. From the foldings of its robe, it brought two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. They knelt down at its feet and clung upon the outside of its garment. O oh man, look here, look, look down here, exclaimed the ghost. They were a boy and a girl, yellow, meagre, 
humility. Where graceful youth should have filled their features out and touched them with its freshest tints, a stale and shriveled hand like that of age had pinched and twisted them and pulled them into shreds. Where angels might have sat enthroned, devils lurked and glared out menacing. No change, no degradation, no perversion of humanity in any grade, through all the mysteries of wonderful creation, as monsters half so horrible and dread. Scrooge started back, appalled. Having them shown to him in this way, he tried to say they were fine children, but the words choked themselves, rather than be parties to a lie of such enormous magnitude. Spirit, are they yours? Scrooge could say no more. They are man's, said the spirit, looking down upon them, and they cling to me, appealing from their fathers. This boy is ignorance. This girl is want. Beware them both, and all their degree. But most of all, beware this boy, for on his brow I see that written which is doom. Unless the writing be erased, deny it, cried the spirit, stretching out his hand towards the city. Slander those who tell ye. Admit it for your factious purposes, and make it worse, and buy the end. Have they no refuge or resource? cried Scrooge. Are there no prisons? said the spirit, turning on him for the last time with his own words. Are there no workhouses? The bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about for the ghost, and saw it not. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom, draped a mist along the ground towards him. So that brings us to the end of this whispered instalment of A Christmas Carol and the end of Stave 3. I hope you can join me again soon for part 9 of this whispered audio reading. Until then,